Good afternoon, Father Ted, and thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today. I'm here on behalf of the Sergeant Shriver Peace Institute, which is uh, most interested in hearing your views about uh, your dear friend, Sergeant Shriver, especially on his faith and his spirituality, which they believe is at the core of much of the great work that he did to combat poverty in the world and to be a, a peace builder. Father, do you mind if I quote uh, Mark Shriver? Uh, in his eulogy uh, to his father, he said, Dad was joyful until the day he died, and I think that joy was rooted in his love affair with God. He went to daily mass, and I mean he went every day, regardless of where he was. Daddy was on his knees, acknowledging that he needed God's help and guidance every day of his life. He knew that if he gave himself to God and asked God to be in control, then it was going to be a beautiful day. Does that sound like the Sarge you knew? My favorite memory of him is I used to stay at the Mayflower Hotel and I'd go to Mass or go over to offer Mass for 7 o'clock at St. Patrick's the Cathedral, which is just about a block away from, from uh, the hotel. And I would go down about 7 o'clock and cut across the alley and into the church and have Mass. But I noticed right away I would do this about 7 o'clock and when I get on the elevator, more than often than not, Sarge would be on the elevator because he stayed at the Mayflower when he had to stay out at night at, in town. And he'd be there and he'd have this missile in his house and I'd say, going to church? And he'd say, yes, I am. And I said, well, let's come along together. I'm going to do the Mass. But he made no big deal out of it. If I hadn't been going over to say Mass, I wouldn't know he's doing that. And as far as I know, he went to Mass every day. And it was not like something showing off or something uh, that he wanted to be spectacular in any way. A lot of people go to daily Mass, but <clears throat> he did it with great conviction. And I'd have to say that if you land and put out all the things in his life, Daily Mass was up there near the top in his priorities. Of course, his marriage was first and his family was second. That's the way it should be. But that Daily Mass was a very strong thing in his life. And he did it with joy and affection. And he could be working at 2 o'clock in the morning, but he'd be on that elevator at 7 o'clock on the way to St. Matthew's to have Mass. Some people say that you were a matchmaker for Eunice and Sarge. Is, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I was a little bit involved, but not that much. I'd, I'd say he had many other things that make them matchmakers, but Sarge was a very uh, careful guy, and he didn't take things like marriage or family just casually. He, he was careful about it. And he loved his wife, and he loved his kids, and there was nothing he had more fun than I can remember yet. On a, you may were there, Tom. It was Saturday afternoon, and we'd go to his house for a, kind of a dinner and talk about Peace Corps. And when I'd get there, the whole gang would be out in the backyard, which is pretty ample. They had a couple of baskets and just a regular football field and everything. And all the Kennedy kids would be out there, and Sarge's kids would be out there, and he and his wife would be out there, and <clears throat> having a wonderful time. <clears throat> and that was like Sarge. He didn't make a big deal out of anything. It was just things he wanted to do, he did. <clears throat> and that was the kind of quality time he had with his kids out there playing touch football. I understand that you and uh, you were walking through Lafayette Park on March 1st, 1961, and actually encountered Harris Wofford and Sarge Shriver. That's the same day that um, President Kennedy signed the executive order creating the Peace Corps. Were they on their way to the White House to, to, to bring the executive order to the, to the president? You're exactly right. I, was, <clears throat> I had two or three jobs at that time, and I had a kind of a temporary office there on, on the square in front of the White House. 
And this particular day, I came out around 4.30 or 5, and I'm bustling across the square, and I run into two guys I knew very well, Sarge Shriver and Harris Wofford. Very determined look on their faces coming across the great square in front of the White House. And I stopped them, and I said, hey, guys, what gives? And each had a folder, and they said, we're going to see the president. And I said, what's up, if you might say so? And they said, oh, yeah, we're going to try to get him to approve the concept of a Peace Corps. And if he does, we'll have a Peace Corps by dinner time tonight. So I said, lots of luck. I'll keep my prayers on that one. Well, I called them up about 10 o'clock that night, and they obviously had been celebrating. <laughs> and, uh, but we had a great talk, and I said, did he, was it a difficult sell? Oh, no, they said. And he heard about it. He said, that's exactly the kind of thing I want this administration to be doing because it reaches out to the poor and helps them. And it's, it's an operation all around the world, as we should be as a great nation. So I'll never forget meeting the two of them on the way to the White House. And that was, you might put a title on it, the birth of the Peace Corps. So when I talked to them that night, I said, you know what? I said, there, you have the Peace Corps approved. There are no Peace Corps anywhere. So I said, may I have your OK uh, tomorrow morning? I'm going to say that Notre Dame is going to train the first Peace Corps group of volunteers in the history of the Peace Corps because we're going to begin the Peace Corps training tomorrow morning at Notre Dame. And that would be the first of a training program, and I'm sure they'll wind up having them eventually hit over 200 of them colleges and universities all around the country. <clears throat> but ours was rather special. And they only had a month to train, so I used to go to the classes and see how they were getting it. And I used to always eat meals with them. And of course, some of them used to come to my mess in the morning. But about half the group was Catholic and half were not, so it was just a very congenial group. And religion has being a contentious thing never came up. It was always a pleasant part of the deal thing. Sarge once said that the, the, uh, the project that Notre Dame ran in Chile was the most successful Peace Corps project ever run by an outside agency. And were you aware of that? Well, I hope so, because I gotta say that uh, we were lucky, that's the first thing, because when they announced Peace Corps, kind of a wild dream, young Americans going all over the world helping people in need. And yet it was a kind of dream that I think just hit on the button what, how students were in those days. They wanted to do something special. And so when we got a Peace Corps at Notre Dame, we knew that we were the leaders and we had to really do it well. And we worked extremely hard. And I remember when the, we only had eight weeks to prepare these youngsters to go to Chile, and we had a very tough, tight uh, preparation, which I guided because I brought the people in to lecture to them and live with them for a while. And when the time came to go down there, Sarge said, well, just put them, take them to Chicago and put them on that night airplane flight to Chile. And to, Tomorrow morning they'll have a, they'll be in Chile and a Peace Corps will be begun, the first overseas Peace Corps. And I said, no, Sarge, I got a much better idea. And he said, what's that? And I said, I'll take them to New York and put them on a boat, the Grace Liner, and they will take that boat all the way to Chile. And they'll have Spanish every day aboard the boat. That'll be the language of the, of the voyage. We'll have lectures every day. We'll gradually be getting introduced to the uh, Latin America, especially after we go through the Panama Canal and start down the Pacific coast of Chile and Peru and Lima, especially. And that's the way it worked out. Did anybody at the Peace Corps object to that, Father? Well, they said, we don't, we think this is not 
you know, part of the mystique of the Peace Corps. We, you know, you take them to Chicago and put them on a night flight, and they wake up in Chile. I said, look, I'm interested in there being being good Peace Corps providers, <clears throat> and I will have the guy who ran the Peace Corps here, who was the head of our foreign languages department, and he will come along with his wife, and we will have training every day, all day, and 21 days of training added to what we've had here for uh, several weeks. I think we'll get them ready. On top of that, they'll have to speak Spanish all the time we're aboard the ship. And Sarge said, yeah, but what's that going to cost us over and above? we got to watch the expenses. And I said, Sarge, it's going to cost $10,000 more than it would just to go to Chicago and fly down. But you don't have to worry about it, I said. Mr. Grace, who runs the steamship line, happens to be a trustee of Notre Dame. So I called him up, and he's going to give us a, a really uh, terrific price. It'll actually come to about $10,000. And he said, if you pick up five, I'll pick up five. So it's going to cost the Peace Corps nothing, because I'll go out and earn 5000 bucks somewhere and put it into the project, and Peter Grace is going to do the other thing. And while it's a little luxurious along a pest piece, uh, you know, a liner, but I said they're going to learn so much more. They'll have chili coming out their ears by the time they hit Valparaiso and land for Latin America. And that's the way it happened. They got to see a lot of Latin America before they even got to Chile. It was a great part of kind of wind up of our training at Notre Dame. <clears throat> and I got to say, they had to speak Spanish <laughs> aboard that ship, and many of them never had Spanish until they came to Notre Dame and had four weeks before we took off. Father, you visited the, uh, the volunteers many times in Chile and you know, had a personal interest in, the, in that group of volunteers, which we, remains to this day. Uh, and uh, That's right. In fact, I had one of them die day before yesterday, and I'll have mass for her today. That's wonderful. Can I ask you a little bit about after the, after Sarge left the Peace Corps, uh, I know at one point in your, the book about you, um, they mentioned that Richard Nixon at one time asked you to run the poverty program, and you told him that you weren't interested in that, that you thought the poverty program was a mess. Do you remember that? I don't, but it sounds like me. <laughs> okay. uh, that was like in 1968. But the Peace Corps was right down my line. Uh, <laughs> it was a kind of thing that we tried to get Notre Dame students to be excited about overseas service, to be concerned about the poor. And most great universities don't give a hoot about the poor, but I thought that would be an important part of a Notre Dame education to be, say, what am I going to do for the poor of this world? And then, on top of that, the whole training at Notre Dame was right down the line of training for other things we do. And it was, uh, it was just exactly what was needed. And I'd say when our group landed in Chile, they were ready to go and raring to go. Do, do, you, do you think Sarge's faith helped him be so effective in, 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 in creating the Peace Corps? and, and, and and the anti-poverty I don't think there's any question about it because Sarge's faith was a very strong thing. And uh, he couldn't imagine starting a day without going to Mass and Holy Communion, which is, I guess, a sign of a great Catholic. And then he really believed what is said in, in the gospel about serving other people and being available for help to the poor. These are very important parts that we tend to forget in the Catholic Church. But the Peace Corps brought them to life and the Catholic Church had them there in its treasure, you might say, and the two came together and it was a perfect fit. Also in Mark Shriver's book, uh, Mark tells a story about a speech that Sarge gave at Yale. Uh, a commencement address, and at that time he felt his father was already beginning to get a little bit forgetful. But he wowed the crowd uh, with a speech where he urged the 
the graduating students to break their mirrors. In other words, uh, to not look into the mirror at themselves, but look to their neighbors and to the needs of other people. Do you think that's a good way of summing up the message that you would give to Notre Dame graduates today? Oh, I'm sure. You can be darn sure we do say that to them. Not in those words of Shriver, but close to it. And I think he was just perfectly at home here, especially with a project like the Peace Corps. And I think it put a whole chapter in his life that was went very deep into his very character. But he was perfect for the Peace Corps, not just the Peace Corps perfect for him. Because these were the kind of things he dreamed about. These are the kind of services that he wanted to give to the world, especially to the poor people in the world. He was, he was in many ways, I'd have to say, a, a modern saint. And I'll never forget that, getting on the elevator at 7 o'clock and seeing him there holding this daily missile and thinking to myself, God, that's what... <laughs> That's what religion is all about. You're going to work all day, but you're not afraid to go to Mass first. And uh, he made no bones about it, but he never talked about it. Just did there, it. Father, um, Sarge's faith was a very simple faith. In fact, um, in the Mass program for his uh, funeral, the family put a quote from the Baltimore Catechism. And yet he was a very broad-minded man. He, he had a traditional faith, but he had a great interest in other religions, and, 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 and theologians, and uh, he read the National Catholic Reporter and Commonweal. Uh, do you find that surprising? No, because the time I spent with him, we talked a lot of theology. He was very concerned about it. But what I was concerned about was, I think he was a good husband, a good family man, a wonderful Christian, I put that word in his broadest sense. And you couldn't ask for more. In fact, if I were running the church, which I certainly am not, but if I were, I'd canonize Sarge Shriver tonight or tomorrow morning because I think he is everything we dream a saint should be. Praying at Mass every day, getting ready for some apostolate that's ahead of him or something that he's in right now. <coughs> a wonderful father, a wonderful husband. You know, you put it all together, you couldn't ask for more. Speaking of the National Catholic Reporter, there was an article not too long ago by Frank Butler, a full-page article with a picture of Sarge, and it said, where are all the saints without cassocks? And he was suggesting that it's time for more laymen and fewer popes to be named saints. What do you think about that? Well, I'd, I'd endorse that immediately. In the uh, early 80s, Father, you uh, began to spend a great deal of time dealing with the dangers of nuclear war. Uh, Sergeant Shriver was involved very much in the same uh, pr problem, uh, working with Father Brian Hare and helping to draft letters about the dangers of nuclear war for the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops. Did the two of you work together at all during, the, during that time? Well, it was a greatest concern of Sarge's as well. And I'm sure I don't remember the exact conversations, but we talked about everything important in life, we thought, and I'm sure nuclear war was one of them, because that was a very high concern in those days, especially when I was running Notre Dame and interfacing each day with young students who were concerned about going off and dying at age 18, so was I. Were you involved in any of uh, Sarge's uh, vice presidential campaign in 1972 or in his presidential campaign in 1976? Um, Bill Josephson seems to remember uh, a meeting with Sarge and Arab Parsigian during the vice presidential campaign. Oh, he came around a lot. <laughs> and uh, I remember a funny story of Josephson, who was a wonderful assistant to Sarge. And he, but he wasn't Catholic, and so we're in a meeting one day, and <clears throat> I don't know, I'm, we're planning the, 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 you know, the project in Chile, and talking about how we're going to work with the church out in the boondocks. So we can work. Once we do that, we're immediately in with the people, because the church in Chile is very close to the people. And finally, <clears throat> he said, you know, I'm getting sick and tired. 
hearing about the Catholic Church. I'm not Catholic, and I hope I'm a good Christian, but all I hear around this office is Catholic, Catholic, Catholic. And I said, well, I can relieve your mind on that. I said, I'm leaving. And I went out and rang the elevator button, and he went right in to see Sarge, and Sarge came bursting out of his office and grabbed me at the elevator. was about to get on and go down brought me to his office and he said, look, I know you're concerned about being open to everybody and uh, I'm sure you're at heart fundamentally a Catholic, but we don't want to hurt anybody and we really need you for the Peace Corps. So he said, uh, why don't you take a trip somewhere and get the Peace Corps begun? And so I said, I'd like to do that in Chile. It's a wonderful country. They're very dedicated Catholics. And I think it's just wonderful from the point of view of physical beauty. You go to southern Chile, there's nothing better in the world. So he said, well, let me make a phone call. So he, he picked up the phone, called a friend in Chicago, and they had a short conversation. And he said to me, uh, here's a check for $5,000, which he's going to contribute to your contribution to the Peace Corps. And that'll get you down to Latin America and back, and whatever is left over you can take for Notre Dame. And I said, no, whatever I have left over is going into the Peace Corps. So anyway, it was that kind of conversation we had a lot. And I, uh, I was always perfectly at home with Sarge. He, he wasn't somebody who was you know, profuse, if you'd say, about his religion. It just did it. Uh, he didn't make a big deal about getting up after three hours sleep and going to early mass. He didn't make a big deal about getting to mass down in places in the world where there wasn't a mass very many places, but there was one, he found it. There's a very famous portrait of you and Martin Luther King in the National Portrait Gallery. Can you tell us about the circumstances of that day? I was listening to radio Saturday afternoon and working in my office here at Notre Dame. And I suddenly came out a program of this fellow named Martin Luther King. I'd never heard of him before. And that he had gone to the Kennedy family in Chicago to get something launched called something in civil rights. And he wanted to have a big meeting <coughs> at the park on the lake, which is an open to meetings, and just south of Chicago, but in the city of Chicago. And he was getting butted around and not much support. So when he went to these various donors, and they all said, no, they had other projects, he was going to have a public meeting on the lake at that wonderful park right on the lake, South Chicago, and see if he couldn't launch this thing. And he hoped some good people would come, but he, at the moment, had nobody except himself going to go to this meeting. So I just jumped in the car, it was a Saturday afternoon, drove Chicago, which is only a couple of hours. I'm a fairly fast driver. <laughs> and, uh, and I went right to this park and parked the car and went over, and was part of a crowd that had suddenly gathered when this word got out that people in Chicago weren't really interested in, in things like Peace Corps and, or the kind of thing that civil rights. Martin wanted to do, civil rights. So <clears throat> I'm there in a fairly big crowd and he's up on the platform with himself and these three or four Protestant ministers that used to travel with him and, were a great help to him. And while he's up there, he looks down and he spots me, and I was fairly well known at that time, and he spots a couple of other guys I was talking to there who are well-known ministers in Chicago. So he stopped at that point and said, go down and get those fellows and get them up here. So somebody came, one of the staff people came over and led us up to the platform, and we were all there in the platform singing, We Shall Overcome, when somebody in the crowd, it wasn't planned, just took a picture. And the picture became 
fairly famous. An interesting thing at that point, Martin Luther King had me on one arm and another layperson in Catholic Church in Chicago on the other arm, uh, a great apostle there. So I got to say that picture bounced around here and there, and now it's in, in the famous picture gallery. Father, this has been terrific, and we really appreciate your taking the time today uh, to reminisce with us about uh, your great work and a great man. Well, I enjoyed talking about these things because it's all behind me now, and yet if I look back over a life that's been here, there, and everywhere, it's that Peace Park concept, its birth, its growth, what it accomplished, and still going that really stands out as one of the rich veins, at least rich for me, if not for other people in this country. And I, I trust that spirit will grow, especially with young people, because we need this kind of dedication to make this country what it can and should be.